Magnet television. Magnet television. Magnet television. You're watching Magnet television because what else are you going to do? Hi, this is John Andrew Frederick from The Black Watch. I think that's one of the most unfair questions that anybody could ever ask because if I say rain, then uh, tomorrow never knows is going to be really, you know, cheesed off. But I'd have to go with And Your Bird Can Sing. Why? Um, because as soon as it comes in with a twin lead, um, it's just something that harks back to the, I think the first time I ever heard the Beatles when I was five, my parents used to love to say, you just started jumping up and down in the back of our Buick. Um, at the days obviously when, you know, a five-year-old kid didn't have to be strapped in. Um, I think any your bird can sing also sort of, you know, even though George is often pegged as the guy who's this anti-materialist, um, I think Lenin, Lenin's do remarks about how, you know, when your prized possessions start to bring you down, um, I'll be round, I'll be round. The idea of, uh, you know, a lyric or a song consoling you for something, I, that's something that I try to in, have all our songs infused with the notion of consolation, of saying, you know, it's okay, I'll be there, let's not worry about it, but just the sheer... Um, ways in which the, that opening lead kind of is a harbinger of the later later lead and builds upon it and the harmonies almost as though they're back to, again to this idea of helping uh, you know Paul's voice comes in and blends in with John's in order to uh, you know to supplement the lovely melody it's just it's, it's a song that sends me every time I'll turn it up That's another difficult one, but I'll try. Um, perhaps it's My Bloody Valentine's Isn't Anything. I was working, when I first moved from Santa Barbara, I relocated to Los Angeles, I was working as an assistant editor for a bi-weekly paper that laughably was trying to compete with the LA Weekly. And um, I got to review music and films and Relativity Records by a creation sent me My Bloody Valentine's isn't anything and I was just floored there's something so mysterious about that record they're my second favorite band perhaps to the Beatles and I think it's a uh, really about the mystery of sex obviously Belinda Butcher when Kevin Shields got her to add to his arsenal it kind of um, in a coterminous way added to somehow him the, his flowering or blossoming as a writer and uh, a ranger of songs and it's so hauntingly acoustic and crunchy uh, punishingly electric with strange chords and odd turns and calm uh astonishing drumming that's sometimes a little bit off that takes you aback and gives you this sort of good queasy feeling um, they sort of just took what I think of as maybe like Dinosaur Jr. and the Cocteau Twins or the Mary Chain, certainly something really absolutely beautifully, beautiful melodically um, with something so fuzzy and gorgeous. But yeah, isn't anything is something I can listen to. I still have the cassette, maybe not the original cassette um, from 1988, but I play it in my Jeep. You know, I have a cassette player in my Jeep. It was one of the, I got last year, it was one of the best selling points of getting this Jeep because I could call out all these old cassettes like Isn't Anything by My Bloody Valentine. I would have to say it was Paul McCartney in at the forum in 1974-5. Um, just being in the presence, it's almost like a magic show. You're in the presence of Paul McCartney and I think three of my very best friends from uh, from high school or college would have been there with me and it's just I was so gobsmacked at, at how astonishing he was and you know the excitement of building up the uh, within each of us uh, uh, my friends and I um, of, of the, the notion of getting to see this legend but I think he comes out and he starts with rock show and there he is with a Rickenbacker bass and it's loud as could possibly be and we had brilliant seats and I, ha I was young enough not to have be so very jaded as to see a bunch of have seen a you know a mess of uh, of, of concerts. 
Um, actually, we're here at uh, Rob Campanella's studio in the middle of mixing a new a new record. Um, and there's Rob coming in right now. Hi, Rob, taking a break from mixing Hi, things. I'm just being uh, interviewed here on Magnet, and they just asked me what's my greatest concert experience. You got one of those. You've seen many, many, many. But uh, could you pick one if you had to? I mean, the, the one that immediately springs to mind is my very, very first concert ever when I was 14 years old. And it was The Who. And that's just my key, the fact that I was so excited to just be going to a rock concert. And The Who are also one of my all-time favorite bands, and, and my age, and just being surrounded by the spectacle, and, and the, the immensity of the band, and, and that they just had only sports around. And I just thought that I was a grown-up. Now and I'm so excited. So it was a week de passage yeah, there, yeah. You know, like you got your, I mean, the, you got your stripes as a concert goer. It was also the first time I saw Spiritualized in '91, and I had no idea what to expect. And their uh, Hollywood Palladium, and then I had no idea that a band could just do that to someone on stage. To, to, to me, that's something being me. That, that just absolutely mind warping, mind blowing, all encompassing, enveloping. You know, sucks you into this magic mushroom psychedelic bubble. Very nice. Uh, yeah, I like that notion of something being done to you by the artist. Yeah, I just, I had no, I, had, I was unprepared. I had seen a lot of shows up until that time through I youth, and I had never seen a show that just did that. So those are the two that just spring to mind. The Who and Spiritualized. Yeah. So, Paul McCartney. Like Paul McCartney and Reeves. Okay. Get it straight. Anybody in the indie band's gonna have an embarrassment of non-riches when it comes to embarrassing moments, given the fact that you're gonna maybe encounter irascible sound people, or just hostile crowds, or no crowd, or things going awry on stage. Um, but one time, uh, something went terribly wrong on stage when we were playing at a place called Molly Malone's, which we used to play every month, an Irish pub, and my dear friend and future bandmate Stephen Chair came and placed a tambourine after he joined us on tambourine. He placed the tambourine over my head so that it became a kind of collar that I couldn't shake off. So it would be like watching um, one of your favorite pets try to get rid of one of those protective um, sort of things while well, I tried to finish singing the song. There's another time in Austin where two bandmates, ex bandmates, shall go unnamed. Um, uh, almost came to blows on stage and then they were both you know, almost in stereo afterwards at each ear of mine you know at the van of the loadout bitching about each other and these were two people who were incredibly great friends with each other and, and with me but again you know I'm not no matter how mortifying things get I've done enough of shows and all that I just I don't seem I seem unflappable I guess I, I, I I'm not capable of being terribly embarrassed by very much anymore um, the other thing would be that you know sort of like I don't know I'm, I'm just kind of embarrassed now this is John Andrew Frederick from the Black Watch and you're watching Magnet Television Sine.